So um, this, this panel is about uh, business transformation. Um, and these are two, two of our friends, uh, two friends of mine. Um, and uh, as a, uh, a nine-year-old that's the same age as my nine-year-old. Um, and they play together. And so that's how we actually know each other quite, quite well through that. They have the same birthday, so we've even shared uh, birthday parties. Um, but uh, uh, beyond that, um, Jonathan was a prior um, son, uh, uh, president and CEO, um, did that through its transition as it got acquired by Oracle. So some interesting um, stories on, on that sort of transformation. Um, and Jonathan started a new company called CareZone. Um, and uh, I've been able to watch from the sidelines how CareZone has developed and have learned a tremendous amount watching how Jonathan's navigated creating a, cert, you know, a, a new business to meet the needs of a community. Um, and, how, and to watch it, how it went from a, a, a different initial idea to one that's, that's uh, uh, much more powerful. So thrilled to have, to have him here. And then Victoria Hale, too. I think many of you may know Victoria. Oh, and by the way, Jonathan sits on the MTM advisory board. Um, Victoria sits on the CTSI board. Um, and Victoria um, started One World Health. Uh, so One World Health is a, it's a nonprofit company, basically. Is that fair to say? Pharmaceutical company. Pharmaceutical company. Nonprofit pharmaceutical company. Um, and was started with uh, some great ideas and some initial core funding from Gates and then has evolved over time in terms of its business model. Victoria, once it was running beautifully, she left and uh, went to Gates for a little while and now has started a new company, um, also a nonprofit pharmaceutical company called Medicines 360 that's working on uh, products in, uh, for uh, reproductive health in women. Um, and, and Victoria has been very useful to us in thinking about models for you know, where do nonprofits belong? Where do for profits belong? How can they work together? Where are those gaps? And uh, in thinking uh, very creatively about those boundaries. So I'm thrilled to have them here, and we're going to just talk about, they're going to tell us, give us some insights, and then we're going to just chat about business transformation and, and how it might be useful to us. So thank you guys right. for coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so again, thanks, you guys. Did you did both get lunch? Yes. We did. We've been fed and watered. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, good. Um, so I, I thought it would be good to start by just giving each of you a chance to sort of tell your story. And um, you pick whatever. I mean, their story. Your whole stories are too long. But pick the key parts that, you know, that uh, might be informative to a group that's thinking about how, how to move from a, more entitlement-based approach um, to one that's built more on a sustainability model. So I don't know, Victoria, do you want to start? Sure. Um, it goes first, or it comes from um, who you are as an individual, right? Where your spirit is derived from, what your character is about. And I learned pretty early uh, that I'm quite entrepreneurial, I'm quite spirited. I'm quite opinionated, and um, I want to, I love making medicines, but I want to do them in the way that I want to do them. And I spent a lot of time looking for outlets for that and didn't find what satisfied me, which was to provide important medicines for people who otherwise are not big targets, right? big customers, to use your word, words, and to figure out how to get to them. Um, one way to do that is to do it through a nonprofit model where you have different drivers and different outcomes. Um, but there are limits to that model. As you know, you're in an academic center and nonprofit institutions. Um, For-profit um, pathways are, um, are limited as well. So my journey has been for more than 12 years now to create something that is neither of those, to state and to demonstrate to others and bring others along, to say that we have some false dualities and false dichotomies that we actually don't have to choose between what is a nonprofit and a for-profit. That's IRS's categorization of it, and it's tax law, and it's complicated. But we as individuals, if we're really about our mission and our purpose, then the exact um, dimensions and characteristics and structures of our business model are something that we can figure out as we move along, that they're really part of our toolkit, this, this business model structure. 
and that we should keep our eye on what is our real goal, our real purpose, our real mission, and then figure out the business as we go along and hire some really smart attorneys who are willing to be on the edge, and you have to have some, some money for that. Um, so not to um, settle, I suppose my, I'm not sure that was a story, Clay, but it's an invitation and an inspiration and a calling to say, um, don't settle for what are the obvious right, structures and boundaries that breaking through and, and creating a middle space, let's say, or a space that's just outside of those two is something that's very important to do. And just because you talk to lots of people and none of them tells you that that is possible doesn't mean it isn't true. It just means it may be a little lonely for a while. Great, thanks. Well, that's a far more profound answer than I'll provide. <laughs> um, so I've only ever been in the for-profit world. And uh, for me, and I think one of the things that's very motivating in being able to spend time with folks like you, the most successful businesses that I've ever been a part of are those that marry an individual's passion with a market opportunity. And you know, the good news is your market opportunity is you know, to go save lives. That's fairly motivating. You, know, you don't find that frequently <clears throat> in the, in the for-profit world. And so what I've spent my career trying to do is, one, recognize that very early on when I was a part of a little startup, and then through uh, successive you know, acquisitions or just being a part of a, a, a new organization, just consistently realizing that the most productivity and, and you know, tends to go along with um, really smart people who are highly motivated by what they think is a great outcome, not just simply a financial outcome, but a, whether it's a spiritual outcome or not an, uh, an environmental outcome or a health outcome. And that's kind of led me to what I do now, which is you know, I was walking along with my 11-year-old, uh, who Clay also knows, um, who is not to be blamed for the apparent injury to his left arm. No. Uh, and he asked me you know, a couple weeks ago, Dad, if you could have any job, um, what would you do? And I looked at him and I said, I would do what I'm doing right now. I mean, every day I wake up, I love what I do, and I'll tell you a little bit about that at some point, I'm sure. And his response was, no, seriously, I mean, if you could have any job. <laughs> Um, so I, I think it's, it's very important to, uh, you know, that, that's a part of personal sustainability, which is no matter what you're doing, if you care a lot about it, the economics tend to work out. You tend to figure it out because you're so passionate about it and the odds are good you've done a good job on behalf of your end consumers. And, you know, to what Clay said before, capitalism has this really neat way of kind of resolving lots of conflicts because they come down to, is there any value in what you're doing? And if the answer is yes, then you'll find a way to catch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you, you make a really interesting point about um, people being motivated by what, by what they do. So on the, on the faculty side, we are actually, in some ways, competing with the standard vision of what faculty members should be doing and what many of them are motivated to do. So in, in essence, each one acts, you know, you've got your little lab and acts like its own little isolated startup with it setting its own goals and all of that. And what we're what we're asking people to do is step out of that and think about, well, how can we make the whole ecosystem better for not just you, but all these other faculty at the institution? So it's interesting because that, that complicates you know, how, how we engage. We have to bring something else, too, to say, OK, this, and I think that's, too, why we focus on creating transforming models, too, of support. It's not just about a providing a service. It's about how can we do that better and create a model for the world in, in doing it. Yeah. But if there, yeah, I mean, it's a, it gets. Uh, yeah. But I think one of the, so when Minnie and I were talking yesterday, I think one of the complicating things when you're talking about <laughs> business models specifically is um, business models are, are rarely something you want to you know, delegate to the leaf nodes. Um, because then you end up with how many people are in the room, 150 or so people? You end up with 150 business models, which is completely ununderstandable to your end consumer. Um, on, on the other hand, uh, ideas around business models are something you want to collect from the leaf nodes because they know most about what the end value is. And they can articulate in ways that maybe the, the trunk of the tree won't understand. Um, and create ideas and create opportunities. So I think that the concept you were talking about before of having to develop new business models and think creatively about how you do it, um, you know, in some sense you want to do that all the time. But on the other hand, when you actually make decisions on how you'll do things differently, you probably don't want that to happen 150 different ways or you'll end up with chaos. Right, yeah. And let's, can I add as well that in my experience, um, 
it's not just people inside an organization such as this who would want, want to do that, or your goals would be that, but there are philanthropists as well and funders who want to do things differently. In the global aid community, there's quite a bit of frustration with how many resources have been applied to problems in global health and how little real forward movement or success or change there really is. So there are many, um, let's say, beginnings of acceptance and understanding of what that means. So what do we do about it? And one of the major um, initiatives that I believe is coming forward is a belief that aid itself and charity itself right, creates some problems and alters the environment that you intend to move in one direction. It actually disturbs natural social entrepreneurs that are there and other, other dynamics. So that thinking about models that we build is not just something that we should do in sustainability, um, but that funders are already thinking about and understanding, and obviously people who we intend to benefit are as well. They're living it. So. Right. I mean, you've obviously been very <laughs> successful at bringing together philanthropists or other foundations, whatever, into your vision. Mm -hmm. So do you want to just talk about how, how you began that process? Where did you even start? The, mm -hmm. Was the nugget of the idea yours? Was it, was it changed in any way through your discussions with others? Or did it stay mm -hmm. purely your own? What did you give up in taking their money? Mm. You know. mm, yeah. So at One World Health, we worked primarily on three programs, one in leishmaniasis, one in malaria, and one in cholera. And they were about $50 million each, so $150 million total. And I had not been a recipient of much funding first. So initially it was, well, we'll give you a little bit of money and we'll see how it goes. You know, so nine grants in total to that amount. Um, by the end, really, I had given up some autonomy and uh, governance in the organization. That was something that I knew would happen um, at that level of funding that, that I think is appropriate to happen. Um, one thing that I didn't want to give up and was one of the reasons that I really culturally had to look inside myself, take some time off and understand what would be next for me is control. I'm a, I can say I'm a very controlling person. I know that about me now. Um, and I have a vision and I bring, I bring a team together as, as you do in, in corporations and you want to empower them to really move forward and learn actually, so change that strategic plan that was the basis of this first, or the, or the funding that you have. So moving with change and taking funders with you, um, balancing control and control of what? Is it control of the details of every day and stepping forward? Or is it control of the larger vision um, and who, who is leading and who should be empowered? Um, whose voice should be the loudest? Um, it's something that we all need to um, understand and accept, and you make deals. There's a quote that's often heard in my household, which is, there's a fine line between helpful and controlling. <laughs> I wonder who says that in your house. <laughs> Both of us. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, having gone through, um, uh, you know, I'd never raised money uh, in, a, in a private company up until very recently, up until about 60 days ago. Um, because I'd been in a little startup that had, you know, we had no choice. I mean, we had no money, no one would dare give us any money, and so we had to figure it out on our own. And we'd made lots of um, sacrifices, and, and that ended up, you know, working out very well, but it was definitely slower and harder, and there was a whole lot of learning that went on. And I then ended up being the, uh, the leader of a big public company, and public financings, for the most part, are very straightforward, they're very transparent, because there's a market. Everybody knows what the price of money is, and you have lots of people bid on you know, supplying you financing. And there's not a whole lot of change that occurs in general in large you know, public financings. There are when you go public. But, um, and then for the first time ever, I just went through the process of raising money for a startup. And, um, and it was fascinating. I suspect it's not dissimilar to raising money from foundations, which is there are lots of egos involved, not just your own. Uh, your first pitch is your worst pitch. so. Don't set up your best opportunity, as we did. Um, and you learn a lot about yourself, and you also see where, where those individuals are going to want to play a role. And uh, again, I mean, this quote just kept ringing through my head as I was listening to these people thinking, wow, you, you really want to be helpful. And translation, you really want to be controlling. Um, but in a way, as Victoria says, that's a healthy thing, because oftentimes um, they can be helpful. And you can find other very interesting feedback or input or ideas that you wouldn't have had on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I mean, the other place where that plays out for us is how we work with 
with the other existing organizations within the institution that are funded, you know, through the chancellor's office or the schools, or and and we have to think carefully about, you know, how we how we work together. When is when is there, a, you know, and and usually the answer is that the you know the sense of controlling is overblown. That working yeah. together, you benefit much more than 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 you do. Uh, if you and I think you can also tend yeah. to filter out the folks who really are going to be kind of negatively controlling. They tend to surface fairly quickly and in some fairly obvious ways. And you just say, well, thank you very much for your interest. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, although you were among a pool of highly qualified candidates, you weren't the top. Right. <laughs> um, so, Jonathan, I think you're the, what you went through with CareZone is, is instructive. You know where you started with the idea for that company, <coughs> and how it evolved over time, and in why it evolved over time to to what it's become. Uh, so first of all, the uh, CareZone is a web service, and it's designed for all of you. Um, when you when it comes time for you to take care of your parents or take care of your children, where do you do that today? Probably wouldn't want to do that on Facebook. And if you're like me, you know, three or four years ago. Um, you're doing that through emails and Google Docs and trying to you know, write stuff down and stuff in your desk drawer. But if you have someone in need in your house or in your family, where is it that you create a profile, manage documents about them, information about them, contacts if you have to share them with somebody, keep track of what medicines they might be on or what therapies or keep a journal. And that's basically what CareZone is. It's a private place to take care of somebody. And it was born of personal necessity, um, in part because I had a child uh, 11 years ago who had some issues that my wife and I were constantly tracking, um, typically in her upper right-hand drawer. And then we'd be on the road and we wouldn't have access to it. Or then a caregiver, would, a babysitter would come over and we'd want them to have access. There was no way to do that. Um, simultaneously, I had a, a brother who um, has lots and lots of complicated health issues with his family. And so we spent some time you know, talking about it. And, and it always kind of lingered in the back of my mind as well. One day it would be great to go solve that problem. But there was a much more immediate problem, which is actually one of the first ways that I got to know Clay. Um, you know, my wife uh, invited uh, one of her best friends to move into an in-law unit in our house. Um, she was going through a really hard time and she just needed a, you know, a space to kind of get back on her feet. She's 46 years old and a month after moving in, she had a catastrophic stroke. And she's 46 years old. And so um, I ended up talking to Clay about this on a, uh, no doubt at a birthday party. And, and he said something which really struck me and my partner who had been trying to figure out how do we go start a business. Um, uh, and he said, you know, the number one cause of stroke is you just didn't take your high blood pressure medicine. And so Walter and I looked at one another and said, surely we can make a difference with that. I mean, how hard would it be to remind people to take their medicines? And if we did that alone, that bump up in, you know, adherence, surely that would have a, a big impact. And so we started actually working with Clay to figure out how we would go do that. And for a whole variety of reasons, that was a really good thing that we will again go back to. It was just hard to wrap a business around it. And so we took a step back and said, let's go actually solve the broader problem first before we go you know, set on the more narrow problem of, you know, now that we know what medicines you're taking, how do we help you do a better job of staying you know, adherent to them? And so the, the grand shift for me was, I didn't know anything about consumer marketing when I started CareZone. I knew nothing about it at all. I'd been running you know, big you know, uh, enterprise infrastructure businesses. Um, and this was like trying to sell the moms over the web. It's a very different world, a very different set of, of skills. But I care deeply about the problem. Everyone that works in our little company has a very motivating story about why they want to work here based on a problem that they're trying to solve in their own families. And if you've got that nucleus of, of you know, kind of power, you can go do anything. I mean, I, I look at the team that we have now, and they're so productive and so fast and so efficient because they're all solving problems that matter to them and they know that will matter to others. And so, um, you know, organizations change all the time. You know, I, I, I looked at Clay's slides, you know, from the back. Every leader has to put those slides up at some point. It's like, well, you know, it's time for us to change. And well, I guess what? Next year, Clay's going to come back and he's probably going to give the same speech. Oh, no, um, no. They're sick of Colorado. Nothing about Colorado. <laughs> and change is just, you know, if only the world would stop changing, then we wouldn't have to. Um, but, you know, change is a, um, you know, it's an ingredient in life. So you got to take advantage of it. Good. 
Perfect. Sorry, I'm distracted. I'm, I got it. I just, I realize I don't have a copy of the agenda, so I can't remember when, when you know, how much more time we have. So now I do. Um, <laughs> so thank you. So, uh, so you better keep this job. I don't think you're going to yeah. get Jay Leno's <laughs> job. Um, so Victoria, so you and I had a great conversation. I don't know, a couple weeks ago, about the sort of dance that that you play. Um, and I, you know, it, it got me thinking a lot about how we tend to work within sort of these boxed expectations of, of what we are, right? So we're an academic center, and so we do this, but we don't do this. You know, we're a non, you're a nonprofit. You don't, you don't do, you don't make money. You don't pay people well. You know, so could you just talk, talk a little bit about that to this group? Because I think that some of the warnings that, that you, um, Put out there are worth us hearing and thinking through as well. Mm. So we talked about a few things. Can you give me a few words to help me remember? Well, the, we uh, went on. We did a we long, talked long about talk. So many different yeah, things. We did. But it was the um, the issue of when nonprofits start to act in part like for profits, and in the risks that come with that. That's so right. you know, in particular, you you made you sent me that book to read. Uh, oh, yeah, uncharitable. Right. So uncharitable by Dan Pallotta. Um, is a great book, we'll start with that, um, about um, lessons that were learned through, um, many of you will remember when nonprofits suddenly started to have very um, high level fundraising events, long bike rides or runs or you know, these national um, days for breast cancer or whatever. Um, the organization that is responsible for bringing these forward was actually a for-profit entity. And you can read the book, but um, that was a no-go. Not because it was illegal, um, but because it didn't look good. It didn't look good that um, a for-profit company should take a significant chunk of this 10 or 100 times amount of funding that the charity had before this event, should, should take a big piece of that. So how do you, as a nonprofit, address these market failures in the world, or market gaps, if you're not allowed to bring in the best consultants, pay the best salaries, uh, retain the best fundraisers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we really need to ask ourselves how, how impactful we can be if we don't have access to the best resources, which is what Jonathan needs to be able to have access to and has much more freedom, I would argue, to do, um, and expectations, therefore, of you. What are our expectations, even, if those are our boundary conditions and, and our limitations, what are our expectations of ourselves and what can society expect nonprofits to do? And if we understand that there are limits with for-profits, there are limits with nonprofits, how about trying to take the best of both? Right? How about trying to move forward in that way? And this is where another issue that comes up is how many people can hold that in their head? There are many people who are interested in hybrids. There are many people who are interested in taking the both the best of a for-profit and a non-profit, but when it comes down to it, um, it's really hard to, hard to do. So there are issues with board management, there are issues with funders. One World Health um, helped to form a for-profit company that spun out of UC Berkeley called Amrus, and One World Health was not allowed to have an equity position or to take any, um, to have a board seat um, in this company for reasons that we can talk about later if that's, if that's important. Just because of the view of what a nonprofit should do and what's reasonable and what it looks like. It wasn't illegal, but what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, we've, this comes up a lot too at, at UCSF. So we're definitely in the position now where we're creating entities that are, that are better as for-profits. And how do we manage that? And we're pretty, pretty restricted by, uh, rules of the university in terms of how those handoffs occur. <laughs> but as we create a larger and larger variety of entities, um, the, this temptation to manage them in-house and then how does that work if they're too successful and is, is getting more and more complicated. Yeah. yeah. But I think the same actually occurs in the private sector as well mm -hmm. because you, you have one business and then for whatever reason you end up with a whole series of assets which might be valuable but they can't be managed by the organization that's there because they don't fit into the strategic vision, they don't make sense, they don't marry, or the worst of all possible worlds, um, the success of that business would actually erode 
you know, your relationships mm -hmm. with your current customers. Right. I mean, one, one way that a lot of companies are running into this now is they're looking at their patent pools and saying, hey, we got a lot of IP, who would we use that against? Well, geez, we'd use it against our customers. Yeah. So Good let's idea. go spin off those yeah. patents. <laughs> right. Let somebody and else do it. Let yeah. somebody else do the dirty right. work. Yeah. So. Interesting. Um, Jonathan, when you made the transition from, okay, let's solve the taking your any hypertensives to, well, let's solve this core problem of how we share documents in a private space for health, um, you, you went back to people and you asked them, what is it that you really need? Do you, you want to talk about that? Because that's something else that we don't, we don't do as much as, as we could. So we, um, you know, my, my favorite uh, answer to a problem is based on sample size one, which is I go ask Sophie, my wife, and then she gives me an answer. And that's our default answer um, unless we have data. And, and that actually keeps decisions really, really fast. Um, but I don't like those answers because they're sample size one. And Sophie lives in San Francisco and has a, and I'll actually I'll give you a, a great example of this. We were looking at ways to incent people to sign up for our service. You can just go to carezone.com and sign up for the service. And there's no billing right now. It's all completely free. And we were trying to figure out ways to do it. And I, and I said to Sophie, hey, Sophie, if you, uh, if you sign up and recommend it to your friends, how would you feel if we sent you, you know, $5 for having one of your friends sign up? And she said, that's disgusting. I would never do that. That's the most offensive thing I can think of. And well, that's because she doesn't need the five bucks. Um, you go talk to somebody who might want the five dollars, you'll end up with a very different answer. So you know, we try to make decisions based on data and not on Sophie. And we try to be very clear about when we are doing one or the other. Um, you know, but our decision process, and one of the wonderful things about uh, the internet is it enables you to connect with and talk to a huge population of people reasonably quickly. And, uh, and as we do that, when you sit and listen to them, um, you know, they end up telling you personal stories, telling you, you know, and starting to articulate market requirements that they may not be able to describe, um, you know, in exact implementation detail, but they can give you a rough idea of what they're actually looking to do. And as that happens, you know, now that we're kind of, this is one of the things that I love about a consumer business versus an enterprise business. Typically in an enterprise business, if you want to get data from the marketplace, you hold a golf event and you bring 200 CIOs in from across the world. And then after lots of alcohol, you find out what only those 200 people care about. And unfortunately, your market's 200,000. It's very difficult to gather data. In, in our world, you know, we have a little feedback button and you get to make a suggestion. So we get 20 suggestions a day and then we know what people care about. So there's actually data that we can use to make, you know, decisions about how we run our business. And that process, that connection back to customers ends up being not just good in the instant, but then when you do what your customers want, they pay you more. And they get even happier because, you know, we, do, we, we don't do, you know, nine out of 10 things we think we ought to do we're not doing them. We've only had resources and time to do one. And so we get lots of feedback constantly about all the things we don't do. But then we actually tell people we heard them and we say thank you for the feedback. And, and it's like they're, they're happier. So that process of just listening and engaging is in and of itself um, you know, very beneficial. Yeah, and we, we've done that to some extent. So we've listened to, to you all, the people who come to our retreats, but also the people who are engaged in CTSI. So we have systems we set aside some of our resources to go to projects that are suggested, actually from anybody on the campus. It just ends up that people who know us better tend to put those ideas forward. But we, we, don't, we don't often go down to the students and say, what is it that you want? Sometimes we do that. We, we, we get feedback from courses they're taking, but not what's missing. And we don't do that for participants in research. What, you know, how is your experience today? We do that for patients, but not so much. So I think there are some, some lessons there to think about how we might expand, um, expand the, the areas in which we get input. Well, and I, and I think to the extent that you have a broader audience than you could meet. So if you're dealing with 1,000 students or 10,000 students, the odds are good you're not going to be able to go touch or talk to every one of them. But um, you know, just. I mean, again, good news. You have the internet too here, I hear. We um, do, yeah. Uh, just yeah. making it a, a core part of what you do that no matter what you've done, the link is available to send you feedback. You know, even unstructured, you just read through what people are talking about. You'll learn things you never learned before. Yeah, it's a great suggestion. We do that for some of our internet properties. I'm using that fancy word that I, right. I hear my <laughs> folks use. Um, but not for others. So. 
um, yeah, I'm sure we could do that much, much more, much more useful. You can always ignore the advice, but at least you have it. So. Right, right. And and I imagine for for you too, Victoria, it's a similar note, right? You you wasn't just your idea. This is what we need. No. So to, yeah. So Medicines 360 was born into a community, a community um, with, with an anonymous donor, a funder who funds um, lots of reproductive health and reproductive justice causes and organizations, even policy work. And one of the major takeaways for us is uh, that this is really a different way of doing business. And particularly after your medicines or technologies are developed, um, there's marketing that is top down and we have the vision of what this market is and we're going to tell you and we're going to maybe even create a disease and then convince you that you need a cure for this disease is something that the pharmaceutical industry does very well, right? With contraception, it's not a disease, right? And we want women to seek what they want and through trusted community providers. So partnerships with providers is the way all this is going to happen, particularly in developing countries, right? But even in the United States with the US public sector. And communicating with partners even, you talked a little bit about partners in you know, terms of between schools or institutes. But we haven't talked about the value. We haven't named it. You were speaking of it, Jonathan. But the value of how, how do you value those 20 people who gave you input last hour in you know, a particular question that you asked? How do you value and the ability to have an incredibly honest and open and trusting relationship with partners who are going to make all the difference in terms of really getting to vision and impact? And then relationships with customers or end, you know, end users as well. So there are many many types of engagements, right, and information and many levels of communication that are, that are all very valuable. So how do, I would encourage you to, to look at all, all of those different types and, and how do you value them? And you may have been giving them away for, for a long time. That's what you, what you do. And to revisit at this time, is that really the best way to have, have impact? The software industry has been great about giving things away, and that's a beautiful way to launch, launch products and initiatives, and, and it's incredible. But considering where we come from in academia and in science, in particular, share it all, right? We want replication, and we want it to carry forward. You know, is, I think sometimes we need to step back to these very basic assumptions and ask, is this, is this really, it, should it always be like that? Should everything we do be like that? What, what is value? And is, is the greatest chance of achieving your vision and mission accomplished by giving it away? or by selling it, or by, what are, there's not just A or Z, right? What, what, are the, what are the names for the ways in between? Yeah, and in fact, you couldn't do what you do if you didn't sell the products of, Absolutely. of the work, right? It just, it, no one would invest. It wouldn't be scalable. You, no one yes. would produce the drug. No one would distribute it. Yeah. So, so you definitely, in everything we do, no matter how clear the mission is up front, this is what we're trying to do, Ultimately, there has to be, has to be some return to yeah. but I, but to, to Victoria's point, I mean, it's not like the software industry happily went down the process of getting to new new business models. I mean, yeah. the customers didn't like it. You know, any change for the most part, change is just hard. It's change mm -hmm. for uh, change for customers, change for vendors. It doesn't really matter. But being able to, you know, take the time with really smart people and sit down and say, let's go re-examine what value we actually think we're delivering. Who should be paying for it, or where the natural, you know, who's getting the advantage? Who ought to be paying for it? Who is currently paying for it? Mm -hmm. And how do we begin to kind of move those things around? Again, if what you're doing has value, someone will pay for it. It's just a matter of, you know, identifying who it is. Right. Yeah. Now, both when we told you guys that, that we were going to be talking about sort of business transformation, you both bristled a little bit and said, "Don't forget about your mission." So, do you want to just? Uh, just I mean, why did you have that? And, uh, we don't want to lose our mission. That's that's crucial. So, so you know, where did that response come from? What's the warning that we need to take away? And um, we have to be mostly. I mean, we really have to be about our mission. That's why we're here. So, how how do we preserve that and still think about being sustainable? Sure. So, in in the nonprofit sector, there's a phrase called mission drift, and it is um, went perhaps it's similar. Yeah. It's identical. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> mission. You, there you go. You go where the money is, right? And you, uh, you deviate from what is your mission. If your mission is large enough, and perhaps perhaps it is here, um, that it's an umbrella that can hold many different, right, specific objectives and targets and goals and programs. With a lot of nonprofit organizations, that's not the case, and you actually need to focus. Um, so, focusing while you're adhering to your mission um, is is sometimes a difficult thing to do. Um, for, for many organizations, that is, many really end up 
out, out there. And their effort to grow bigger, thinking bigger is better, rather than partnering. So how often will you become big? Right? We're at a university here, this is part of the state of California. Um, you know, how big is good and how big is not good? Right? And how much is partnership? If you're not going to get big, how are you going to achieve your mission right? and, your, and your vision? Is that through partnership? Is, you know, what, are, what are the other ways to do it without becoming so big and therefore needing so many resources and perhaps needing to creep or drift with your mission? I think in the, in the private sector world, it's a little bit clearer because your principal objective is to maximize shareholder value. And so you know, there's rarely, or that's not to say, so when you're moving towards something because it's a bigger market, for the most part, no one's going to look askance at that and say, you know, that was dumb. Um, on the other hand, there are all kinds of things. And I guess my, my response to the, you know, kind of coming back to, but what's your mission? What, what is it you're trying to accomplish? Revenue generation is not your mission. And I guarantee you in this room, there are enough really bright ideas and really good services and great intellectual property that you could go set up, you know, lots of different entities. They'd probably go make a lot of money. They would alienate you from your core objective. They might violate all kinds of principles or brands that you hold, you know, dear. Um, so it's really trying to look at, you know, what is the objective you're trying to accomplish first and foremost, and now what are the enablers you can use from the business model, as opposed to what new business models could, keep, could we come up with? I mean, the one that I've been spending way too much of my time on is patent litigation. You all create intellectual property. Go create a bunch of patents. You could sue a lot of people. You could make way more than the 50 million just on one, you know, suit alone. Probably not really, you know, it doesn't help you progress your mission. It might help no, you, no, 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 no. you know. <laughs> Let's talk, Eric. We would, we would yeah. stop being friends after that. And <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll, actually, but another good example. So we, at, at CareZone, people share, it's their, I mean, we don't have access to the data. People are talking about the problems that their families have. And every problem has some, you know, family issue one way or another. It's just aging, it's development, it doesn't have to be health related. And um, we had a large medical supply company come to us and say, hey, you actually know the, among your customers the people who would be most likely to buy our supplies. So why don't you just give us access to them and we'll pay you just you know, gobs and gobs of money. And that was like a five second conversation. He's like, you must be kidding. Today, that would have meant a lot more money, but you know, that would have meant a lot fewer customers because who wants to share private family information with a medical supply company and a pharmaceutical company. It's just that's not, that's not how people manage their families. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, this has been a great discussion. I want to open it up to, uh, um, to, to the audience and see if there are any questions out there. Yeah, Eric? Yeah. Um, Is he the lawyer? Yeah. No, he's not a lawyer. <laughs> he's a the techie. Guy. Yeah. Oh, you need to anticipate, you need to know that it's going to happen. And you need to plan for it, right? And you need to manage it, yeah. And you need to be thick-skinned, but have, have the organization above you in particular uh, very um, welcoming, accepting, and supportive of regardless of the turbulence that you experience on this journey, that this is where you need to go. Yeah, but you, you have to know that it's going to come because you're leading, you're on that leading edge. And I guess I'd, I'd give you a, a related answer. Um, so we're about to go off and do a bunch of hiring, and, I, you know, and I've been in a very big organization, and now I'm in a very tiny organization, and the person who's gonna go off and do some hiring is like, well, I'm ready to go, I got, I got the ideas of who I wanna hire, and I got some money, I'm gonna go make it happen. I said, no, actually, I want you to you know, write down, based on what's on the wall, what our mission is, and then I want you to interview everyone in the company so they know what our values are, so we know who's gonna fit and who's not gonna fit. And they're like, well, why do we wanna waste the time doing that? It's like, well, if you don't have your values well understood now, um, then you're going to end up with a banner ad for a medical supply company on a UCSF property, and that's probably not going to fly because that starts to stain your brand. So I would, number one, hope that you ruffle some feathers, because if you're not, then you're not pushing hard enough. But I would also know which feathers are okay to ruffle, because I don't think you want to ruffle the ethics feathers. You don't want to ruffle the business practices feathers. I mean, there's all kinds of feathers you want to leave, just let them lie. Um, but I would, I would hope, I would motivate you to go ruffle fit. That's where the fun comes in. 
Like, look at that, he's upset. He must not want to pay for what he's getting for free. <laughs> Good. And there are communities of social entrepreneurs who've been trying to blend the worlds of you know, for-profit and non-profit and make things happen that are in this same place. So you're not alone doing this, but going to a different um, sector, perhaps for lessons learned, and communicating and spending some time hanging out a little bit, getting to know each other, sharing. You're not alone. We're not alone. Great. So one of the, um, sorry not to over answer the question, but one of like the hot things right now in the VC community are double bottom line businesses. And they're the businesses that are doing good for the world and are going to do well by their shareholders. And one of the financiers who's, you know, who joined us, we picked him because of that. And he, you know, so all of his portfolio businesses are things that are good for the planet. And they'll be wildly successful. So I think you are, you are highly aligned already, you know, yeah. and. Uh, Great. One more question, yeah, Laura? Just a question around this uh, hybrid model for Victoria. So a private for-profit firm is responsible to, accountable to its stakeholders, shareholders, right? A nonprofit's accountable to benefit a defined community. So how do you define accountability in the context of a hybrid? Who do you actually, uh, are, who are you accountable for? That's good. It's a good, good question. That's how you set it up. So Medicine360 is a 501c3 organization, and we've spun out and fully own a for-profit entity, a C-Corp. So it's a subsidiary. Correct. It's a wholly owned subsidiary. When we get to 49%, if we choose to take investors for partial ownership, you know, then, then we have an issue. You know, cross 50%, what does that, what does that mean? Um, so right now it's pretty clean. There are more complex uh, models. So our, the answer is our parent is the nonprofit organization. And we, we have a for-profit below it as the child. But we're partnering with a for-profit commercial entity to market our product in the United States. And managing that, Medicines 360 as a nonprofit will manage that and partner to, to make it. This is a little complex. We can talk maybe after for details. Okay? Great. Good. Well, this, is, this has been a great discussion. Thank you very much. These are sort of not things we normally talk about in this group and perspectives that we, you know, we, we don't discuss, we don't think about. So. I really appreciate you all enlightening us about this, and I and I hope uh, you all. I, hope, I certainly learned something. I hope you all did too. So thank you very thank much you for very coming. Much. Thank you.